God, may we who on this day have been strengthened by your word and your sacrament, learn from the example of blessed John Duns Scotus, our brother, to seek you above all things and to live in this world as your new creation. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I ask Father to run off, but he probably has forgotten so there is a lecture outline for so you bear with me. The text I'm going to uh, unpack for you today is the Testament of St. Francis. This is a, a talk that I gave on, we have here Franciscan study days. I gave it on the 6th of September, and uh, Ron and Paul and Jermaine were here, and they asked me to repeat this to you. Now, the first thing I want to present to you is that you and I have to seek the real Francis. We've made Francis into the image we want, the animal lover, the flower boy, the peace man. I doubt there are any friars who could imagine Francis scolding, Francis being difficult. Yet in his rule, he talks about putting friars in jail. So just as with Christ, we have to seek the real Francis. We have a Democrat Christ, we have a Republican Christ, we have a liberal Christ, we have a conservative Christ, we have an American Christ, we have a European Christ. We've split our Lord apart and we split Francis apart. And so the first, the way you find out who the real Francis was, was by a good biography if you can get one but by looking at his writings. And that's the thing we don't do. I spent years and years and years teaching about Franciscana, maybe 40 years, and every time I do, the friars say, well, we never, we never read that. What the hell we read? So the first thing I suggest to you is that you purchase and read, your constitution is talking about reading Talk about spiritual reading. I read your constitutions very carefully. They talk about the necessity of reading. We'll talk later on what our obligation is regarding even the church. Don't give people answers to today's questions with yesterday's information. You should all have the catechism of the Catholic Church. So when someone asks you a question, you tell them what the church did, not what you think, what you feel conservative, you know, I noticed this morning, who receives communion of the hand, who does receive communion of the hand? You're free to do as you wish, but that doesn't make you better. We have a woman here, for example, who refuses to receive communion of the hand, and then takes the saborium and distributes communion. <laughs> and when I told her, she's highly insulted. Oh, I'm not worthy to receive our Lord in my hands. Then you take the saborium and you distribute. We don't connect. We don't connect. So that I suggest to you, and hopefully I'll get the text from Father uh, Mark later, this important biography by Vauches, Vauches, V-U-C-H-E-Z, Francis of Assisi, where he presents with great scholarship the best information about Francis today. Everybody ought to read it. Ron, I think you have a copy. Have you looked at it? It's yeah. the best. The most modern, most up to date, you gotta read it. Have to read it. Now, St. Francis' writings are important, yet for as I, as I said a moment ago, for years and years and years and years they were not even paid attention to. We don't know why. When I was a novice, the only thing we read was the rule. Partly because they, they weren't very good editions. Although from the 1600s, we have an edition. This is the first edition of the writings of St. Francis published in Latin, 1638. Oh, wow. And the reason it was published this way is so the friars could put it in their pocket. <laughs> in Italy, for example, the rule of the testament, which is this, is sewn into the back of the capuch of the friars. 
And so they always have the rule with them and the testament with them. That doesn't mean you read it. But now we have wonderful uh, editions of the writings of St. Francis. We have this edition, which is less expensive, the Francis and Clare. So all the writings of Francis, all the writings of Clare. And we have the more expensive four volumes, which is Francis and the Biographies. This is about $40 each. So you can get the same thing right here. And everybody should have it and read it and use it. Now, when I talk about St. Francis's writings, yes, St. Francis was a writer, not an author, as someone who sits down to write a book, but he was a writer. He knew how to write. He knew how to read. Uh, he knew Latin. He knew Italian. He knew French. Not perfectly, but he knew it. And we have writings of St. Francis that are authentic, even from his own hand. I don't know whether you keep up with things, but the United Nations will start an exhibit next month of several documents coming from Italy, the Canticle of the Preachers. Blessing to Brother Leo, they will be on exhibit in the UN and then in Brooklyn. You know, authentic texts. So St. Francis is a writer. He has written. He's not an author who sits down like Scotus and writes a big theological study, but he writes, writes to Brother Leo, for example. He writes to St. Anthony. Again, God knows what we've made of St. Anthony. St. Anthony was a professor in the scripture scholar and a preacher. And he teases St. Anthony. He says, to Brother Anthony, my bishop, because the ones who had the role of teaching were the bishops, I give you permission to teach theology to the friars, provided it does not extinguish in them the spirit of the gospel, to which all things ought to contribute. Very important, the translation. The old translation was, to which all things ought to be uh, submissive or something. Subservire in Latin means contribute. St. Francis wanted everything we do to contribute to God. What Scotus is talking about in the prayers today. By his example, may we seek God above all things and live in this world as a new creation that's just supposed to be, by the way. I wonder when you think about that. Your expression of Franciscanism 25 years now is supposed to be a new creation. Huh? You're supposed to not make the same mistakes we do or have. You're the new creation. And so St. Francis to Anthony, I give you permission to teach theology to the brothers, provided it does not extinguish in them the spirit of the gospel to which all things must contribute. <coughs> we have now, just came out a couple of years ago, the final critical edition of the writings of St. Francis in Latin, Italian, done by uh, Father Paolazzi, that is taking all the manuscripts, critical edition is you take all the known manuscripts and you see how, how the, the text is deformed. When you do critical textual criticism, the shortest reading is usually the most authentic. If a text says it was a rainy day, because remember the texts were copied, before you know what the word appears, it was a very rainy day. It was a, it was a stormy rainy day. It was a black rainy day. You see all the additions made. Textual criticism goes back to what is at least the first edition. I'd be able to say these are the basic authentic words of St. Francis. And we have this now. And of course, with privilege comes responsibility. You are more responsible for some of the old fries. We didn't have it when I was a kid. And the rule. Now we all have the privilege of all the writings of St. Francis, and with privilege comes responsibility. And one of the things I noted in, in carefully reading you know, the third, uh, third Order Rule and then your constitutions, which, which enflesh that rule and, and flesh them beautifully. And I say that not because Paul is here, Ron, they enflesh them beautifully is that this is serious business. This is a life task. And you have to be the new creation. Otherwise, you should be OFM. What do you bring to this Franciscan 
uh, a way of following Christ? What do you bring that's different than what I have? Maybe better than what I have. I hinted twice in my sermon that when the order was all brothers, all, all brothers in the sense of, of, of lay brothers, and few priests had a very different dimension than it has today. We're still fighting the Holy See about whether a, a, a non-ordained friar can be a provincial. No. Non-ordained friar can be general. No. And the order keeps fighting, and the Holy See keeps saying no, because they don't understand our charism. As, for example, we still call ourselves a mendicant order, not mendicants at all. St. Francis says the rule of friars are to work, and when they are not given the wages of their labor, they may think. But we're not a mendicant order. And you are supposed to be men and women who live in the world in this Franciscan spirit, this kind of new creation, living it in a new way. Cardinal Malley, as I tell you, with whom I, I do a lot of work, he's welcomed the friars of the, of the reform, the reform of the reform. Now he told me that at Benedict Rochelle's funeral two weeks ago, he came back a day early from Rome to be at the funeral in New Jersey, who was missing the members of Benedict's Capuchin province. He's considered a traitor, troublemaker, because he reformed. And so uh, Benedict said, uh, the Cardinal said, they were of course the friars of the renewal, but very few Capuchins from whom Benedict had come. He said, a traitor, troublemaker, how dare you? And these are the things you have suffered sometimes. Why do you want to do this? Why don't you be an OFM? These are the things that Paul and, 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 uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, the other friars will talk to you about. When's the birth of this charism? You sent me that, that wonderful kind of essay. When's the birth of this charism? Why? Why don't you just be an OFM? Why don't you just be a capuchin? You have all the obligation and run to, to pass this on, huh? even sometime today. What was the dream? You have to be a new creation. That's why I hit you strongly last night saying, let's not play friar on three days. I didn't mean that in, 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 in an offensive way, but I did mean it in an offensive way. Because this is something you come here to do be strength and so on, then go back and, and live this, this very, very, um, I would say challenging life, much more challenging than mine. It's easy to be a friar of the monastery. How do you have to combine it as a married man, as a single man, someone divorced, someone who maybe has been hurt by the church, thrown out of communities or saying you're not welcome. <coughs> And yet, as, as the Constitution say, you find your way back, huh? I think there's a line in it, correct me if I'm wrong, for those who have now been able to come back, right, Paul, is that, that, that line there? The beautiful line. Because you all have your petit histoire, which we'll talk about in the, in the, in the text when St. Francis talks about the beginning of his vocation. He says, no one told me what I ought to do. The Lord inspired me. That's true of every one of you. Paul. Lord inspired you. This is important, huh? Do you understand the, the point I'm making here, huh? This is not someone sitting in the house, and the hell with it. I think I'm going to found a new group. Well, that's what Cardinal Mary is saying. It'd be very, very respectful of these groups, huh? Because they're all offenders. What the hell are you? At conventuals, in, I know in Rensselaer, they said, I don't know who the hell these guys are. One friar told me. But St. Francis said, nobody told me what I ought to do. The law told me. So you have to live your experience with a certain pride, huh? No creation. And as I said in my homily this morning, there is legitimate diversity in the church. We have knocked that out in the friars. We, we always said the Jesuits were always the same. No, the friars always say the Jesuits are. Allow people to grow. We have a certain model, man. So one of the things that you bring to the church is you allow people to grow in different ways, different stages, different parts of their life. What 
a marvelous thing. I had to fight all my life to be a university professor. Should you do it? Can you do it? Is it Franciscan? Because the provincial didn't even know history. Well, you're going to teach in a secular university, yes. You're going to live in a diocesan parish that was not around, yes. Mm -hmm. But they took the check every month. Because <laughs> <laughs> for them, they had no problem taking it. And when I was a lecturer, when I was an assistant professor, when I was full professor, when I had tenure, when I became the dean, and I had my, my, my uh, going up, my uh, retirement dinner, my provincial didn't even come. I was named Professor Emeritus at the university, the highest degree the university can give you. He didn't come. Because he couldn't understand diversity. He understood the friars of being in the parish, saying mass, hearing confessions. I said mass, I lived in the parish, I heard confessions. But you, you, you underscore that diversity. That's something you bring. Huh? I read stuff well. Oh, yeah. I read it very carefully because that's my duty and my privilege. You show how you can be a friar in many ways. And that's it, very important. But then there has to be that basic non-negotiables. St. Didicus, St. Diego, and Scotus. Two completely different, huh? But basic non-negotiables. Love of our Lord, love of our Lady, uh, uh, um, allegiance to the papacy. Non-negotiable. And what's non-negotiable for you is the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The Gospel, of course. So, shortly before his death, 1226, St. Francis dictated a document that he called My Testament. My Testament. Um, and I'll take some lines and read them to you and comment on them. And this is how he begins his testimony. He says, I think it's on page, what page is it? How much? 337. 337. Not in this one? 337? No. No, 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 here. 153. In 153. Okay. All right, he says here, you, I say, you get my notes later, Rob will run them off for you. This is how he starts off. 153. Page 154, Testament of St. Francis, lines 1, 2, and 3. Pay attention to the words. The Lord granted me, Brother Francis, to begin to do penance in this way. While I was in sin, it seemed very bitter to me to see lepers. And the Lord led me among them, and I had mercy on them, upon them. And when I left them, that which seemed bitter to me was changed into sweetness of body and soul, and afterwards I lingered a little and left the world. Those first three lines, Francis now, as he's dying, is remembering his conversion of 20 years before. And he does so because it's important for the friars, just as it's important for Paul <coughs> to tell you about his moment on his career. <coughs> Very good. How did this all start? This is the only place in all Francis's writings where he talks about his conversion. His conversion is important and fundamental for him and for the friars. It's important to realize Francis's starting point from which he views everything. The Lord granted me. His conversion does not begin with his desire, but the Lord is the source of his desire and therefore the absolute gratuity of grace. <coughs> the Lord granted me. I'm going to keep referring this because this is what you should be doing when you talk. You're preaching your 25th anniversary. How did the Lord grant you? How did it stand? <coughs> your mind, your heart. You have to share that with the brothers. Now, St. Francis never talks about himself. This is the only time he's dying, it's the last two months of his life, 
And he goes back to his conversion 20 years before. And he says those words. The Lord granted me, Brother Francis, to begin to do penance in this way. He's saying, this is how it all started. Paul, Ron, Jermaine, whoever, you guys have to do that. How did it all start? Why did it start? What did you intend to do? What are you doing now? How near, how far are you from that original charism? In 25 years, what has been what Cardinal Newman calls loss and gain? What is the loss? What is the gain? Loss and gain. When Newman was making his, uh, after his conversion, okay, he wrote a long uh, book. He said, for example, I miss the Anglican hymns. I miss my, my friends. This I lost, but this I gained. And this is the story that you, for all Jermaine, all of you have to tell. What did the Lord do to you? Why did this happen? And then St. Francis says, and then the Lord gave me brothers. Who came first? Why are you growing? Why are some people leaving? I mentioned last night. Doesn't mean bad. It could be. We have a woman, for example, the third order here is very, very pious. Nice people, very pious. And a young German woman came and she said, mm -hmm, not for me. It's not enough meat. I don't want to hear about St. Francis and the birds. I want more meat. She left. She became a Dominican church. Sometimes when people leave, we have to listen to what they leave. Sometimes it's an honest critique. Sometimes it's the wrong problems. But this text has to be incarnated in you. Huh? The Lord granted me, Brother Paul, to begin to do penance in this way. And this is what happened. You don't have to tell the secret of your soul, but you have to say. He says, the Lord granted me to begin to do penance. Common medieval term to do penance. St. Jerome translates the Greek word metanoia as conversion, penance. But Francis is not talking about corporal austerity. He's talking about gospel conversion. A literal change of direction. <coughs> The Lord granted me <coughs> penance, and I went among lepers that I didn't like, and I changed my life. That is to say, he began to enter into a radical conversion or change, little by little an unconditional return to God, and all his life he remembered this grace, even at the end of the life. Remember that. All his life he remembered this grace. Now, each one of you, not only Paul, as your petite histoire. I, I think of my life, 58 years of friar. I remembered when I first wanted to be a friar. Uh, the priest came to preach the Italian missions in my parish, and I was attracted to the habit. I was attracted to the habit. And then as a kid, more and more, I wanted to study. I never felt attracted too much to the Austin priesthood, but notice I wanted to be a priest. I didn't understand friar. And my pastor, who was a very smart man, he said, Figure me, if you want to study, mm. he said, You better be a Jesuit or a Dominican. But he said, They won't take you because you're Italian. <laughs> and the diocesan won't take you because you're Italian. So go be a friar. And I entered the friars because I wanted to be a priest. And then, little by little, God revealed to me that to be a friar is one thing, to be a priest is another thing. Two different vocations. There are many friars today who still think that being a priest meant they became a friar. That's part of our problem. That's why I said yesterday in my sermon, those of you who were here, the Jesuits do not call uh, the words they use late, they don't use the word lay brother, they use coadjuda, co-worker. Because lay brother always had a kind of submersive, uh, negative uh, tone. You couldn't make it. When I was a kid, they said, well, he couldn't study Latin. They make all kinds of excuses, okay? He didn't do too good in Latin. Or he wasn't smart enough. There were guys who simply wanted to be lay brothers. Or we 
lost that garrison. You brought it back, and I'll listen. You brought it back, and I'll listen. Now, we've had a great crisis in the order, very strange. We've got a whole bunch of lay brothers who, as soon as the diaconate, the permanent diaconate, became permanent deacons and became more clerical than me. Or the collar, the stole of the paper. I'm Brother Deacon. They became more clerical than us. Because they never understood what it meant to be seen. Just a friar. But now we all enter the order, hopefully, to be friars, and then some of us are called to the priesthood. It's very important. These are very important theological points I'm making, huh? The political ramification, but these are very important theological points. So you have to ask yourself, what is your petite histoire? Because I hope that you didn't become a brother of San Damiano on the rebound. Well, I couldn't enter the Jesuits and the Dominicans said, get the hell out of here. So I found this group and I joined them. No, you should join here because the Lord has called you here to this type of life. There's that danger huh, in your group. And I think that, that, that the, that the, uh, the um, council, when they study a man, hmm? just finished reading last night, <clears throat> an important biography of Fulton Sheen, written by his secretary, and said when Archbishop Sheen went to Rochester, he was interviewing throughout the year all the kids in the seminary. And at ordination time, he said to one another, you know, you're not ready. You're not ready. And so you have to be very careful to discern that. Huh? If someone, well, I couldn't enter the Capuchins, the Jesuits say, get out of here, so, so I join you. We take anybody. You know? Extremely important. This is a vocation. Special vocation. Special character. And that's why Paul, Jermaine, you guys have to say, the Lord inspired me. The Lord, eh? granted me, Brother Francis, to begin to do penance, a radical change of life. And that radical change of life has brought you to this day and this hour. If it wasn't a radical change of life, then you only entered the Brothers of San, uh, San Damiano as second best. You have to examine yourself. Huh? Now, and then he says, well, every conversion, of course, has a before and an after. Francis says he was in sin. And Chilano, when you read Chilano, he mentions all the sins that he imagines St. Francis could have committed. He was a young man. Even now, modern scholars are saying that probably also he had some homosexual experiences. Vauchez, very important, says, look, guys, let's face it, we simply don't know. So leave it alone. Why is there this period interest in finding out what sins that he committed? Maybe like me. He says, when I was in sin, pasta, leave it there. We wanna, what, do we, what do we want to know? Michelano just makes a list. He gets a seven deadly sins, throws a few more in. He's he was a young kid, so he probably got drunk. He probably was rowdy. He was disobedient to his parents. He liked girls, maybe he liked boys, whatever he did. Because he, the reason why they're saying the homosexuality was it was more easy to share some kind of sexual experience among boys than among girls because of the society. Vouchers makes the point. Useless speculation. And not only useless, maybe kind of weird. Kind of what the kids call uh, uh, mind porn. Huh? I don't read the magazine, but I get it up here. I want to know, I don't need this. this kind of mind. <laughs> <laughs> I have a boyfriend, right? a little mutual masturbation or something. I just didn't even believe it. But except what he says, he says, when I was in sin. And he doesn't tell us about his sins, but he tells us the realization, the moment of rupture, of break, he tells us about it before and after. He situates his conversion in, in his own day. He's not some Paul of Tarsus. 
Rather, in his world, in his society, there was a terrible ex situation, an exclusion, a horror of another person. Remember, the leper had to ring a bell so that people would run away from him. They were considered the walking dead. They were considered contagious. No one could associate with them. There was even a church service when you became a leper that you were brought, that you were blessed, that a cloak was put on you, a bell was given you, and you were thrown out of the city. So, uh, they, they were the walking dead, they were contagious, no association with them. There was this rite that I talked to you about, which kind of a burial. The lepers kind of lived in a cemetery, in a hole, they couldn't enter the city, they couldn't use water, they were outcast, and Francis' reaction to them is the reaction of his day, he didn't like them at all. And then he says everything changed. What was bitter to see became sweetness. The audition of them is buried up the street. Begins the phenomenon of man by saying to see. I think all life consists of that verb. know how to see. And St. Francis sees the leper, he knows the outcast, he knows the ceremony. He says, I began to see and uh, I began to change. When I taught ethics, <coughs> I have to teach my students about what's called the fundamental moral experience. The fundamental moral experience without which there can't be any ethics. Remember, Morals is what we do, ethics is the reflection of what we do. So I can be highly moral, my mother was highly moral, she don't know about ethics. You could be highly ethical and be very immoral. Fundamental moral experience is that I look at Jermaine and I say, he has a beard, I don't, he has hair, I don't, he has some health challenges, I have different ones, he's different from me. Fundamental moral experience is to look at him and say, yeah, but we are absolutely the same. Without that, ethics is impo impossible. Why should I reflect on what I do to you? What the hell with you? Screw you. When I went to Auschwitz, <clears throat> people always talk about going and see the crematorium, the crematorium. No, but there's nothing there. Six million Jews, remember Auschwitz contained priests, contained homosexuals, contained the physically uh, handicapped. And the first thing that Hitler did was get rid of all those physically handicapped. He murdered, he murdered all of those. What struck me the most was going into the God house. And I'll forget it, you go to the God house, a very, very nice lodge. And uh, in the common room, like our common room downstairs, there was a bookcase poetry, Rilke, wonderful poems. And there was a long playing uh, record. And I looked at the poems, very nice and one, beautiful stuff. And I sat in a chair and the, the woman said to me, I was with Cardinal Wright, God rest him. She said, but you realize, Father, that the lamp you're sitting next to the shade is made of human skin. And the Nazis were able to achieve this because they began to consider the Jew or whomever, the homosexual member, as subhuman. What do we do when we argue with someone and we, we, we don't we say, act like an animal? And when a person acts like an animal, we can do terrible things to that person. So the fundamental moral experience is I look at Carmine or Jimmy and say, you're different from me, but we are fundamentally the same. Without that, ethics is not possible. The hell cares what I do to you. You're, you're an old man, you have a lot of problems, you're expendable. So Francis says in this text, I began to see. He had that fundamental moral experience and that the excluded person he sees as similar to him and therefore he changes his heart, his mind, his eyes, his head. Therefore the order, 
if we're going to approach Christ like Francis, has a special uh, um, mission to those who are excluded in our society. We have to teach others to see. We're still persecuting the homosexual. We're racist. We're sexist. Oh, I don't know what I want Hillary to come to be your president. She's a woman. <laughs> you're a fool. If you say these things, you're a fool. You're an absolute fool. Talk about her, Hillary Clinton, whether you want to elect her or not. But her being a woman doesn't exclude her. If you do that, you're sexist. Or you're a racist. We use the word nigga still, don't we? I'm Italian, we use the word walk, we use the word kinny. When I was a young priest, I was preaching for the missions in a parish on Sunday, big parish in Boston. I went in after Mass to get a cup of coffee, and the Monsignor was there, the men and women who collect money, and they were in the other room, but I could hear them. And one of the men said, um, a young priest preaches very well, really, really good. And the Monsignor said, oh yeah, for an Italian boy, he speaks English very well. Mm. <laughs> so I went in because I got them like this. <laughs> I said, I just heard what you said. You were born in Ireland. My mother and father were born here. I am more American than you. What the hell are you talking about? We're still racist, we're still sexist, we can't shake it in our country. We still talk about mixed marriages. <coughs> we still talk about interracial marriage. What do you mean interracial? There's only one race, human race, of which there are variations. No such thing as an interracial marriage. There's one race, human. I just told my students at university, when you fill out these forms and it says race, put on human. The computer's all fucked, it goes crazy. So what does it mean? <laughs> the computer goes, ah! <laughs> <laughs> what the computer wants to be is put in black, white, or other. There's one race, which is human. But do we as friars believe that? You know, I wrote a still if a guy says he's gay. Mm -hmm. So most of them hide it. They lie. The Jesuits who are pretty honest say we accept in, in the Constitution. We accept gay people, they have to live celibacy like anybody else, which you hint to in your thing, but you should even do a monk specific. Do monk specific. Then nobody is excluded. Nobody wants to follow Christ. No matter how petite his is. I think that's part of our charism. We're not doing it. We still say, oh. psychological, biological, this test, urine test, blood test, brain test, whatever. <laughs> Ultimately, the person is born on me as she is. <laughs> so, St. Francis begins to see. The Lord granted me, Brother Francis, to begin to do penance in this way. Begin to change in this way. Okay, the Lord granted me, Brother Francis, the, the ability to change in this way. When I was in sin, it seemed to me very bitter to see a leper. To see. The Lord himself led me among them. I had mercy on them. And when I left them, what seemed to me bitter to see was changing the sweetness of body and soul. The fundamental moral experience. I see the person as the same as me. I see the person as a child of God, etc. Twenty years later, Francis says that experience was foundational to his return to God, his human spiritual journey, his mystical experience. The Lord led me. How has the Lord led you to this day, this hour? Why are you here? Why are you a brother of San Damiano and not a friar of the renewal or an OFM or a Capuchin? The Lord led me. The Lord led him to lepers and Francis allowed himself to be led, taken by the hand,
So poverty, this is what theological point I want to get clearly, is not the determining element of his vocation. Francis wanted to follow the poor Christ. No, the fundamental and determining element of his vocation is to see the excluded as included. He doesn't say it in this first beginning of the rule that I, I, I began to be poor and thus I followed Christ. I was attracted to the poor Christ. The Lord granted me, Baba Francis, to begin to do penance, to change my life in this way. When I was in sin, it seemed to me big to see that this book. His fundamental experience, his mystical experience, is not embracing poverty. It's embracing the poor, excluded person. And I submit to you that's a special vocation of the order. Pope Francis preached about it here today. By the way, you can get online his morning sermons, huh? Get it right away online. He said the other day, he said, you know, he said, we still have the people determining who the priest can talk to. You can talk to the good person, you can't talk to the, 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 the prostitute in the parish or the gay kid or the transgendered person. We determine very carefully who we can talk to. And he said, I challenge priests to talk to people even in the fear of losing their reputation. Now we say, oh, 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 nice. But do you accept that? Do you really accept that? That Francis's fundamental conversion was not following the poor Christ. That comes later. His fundamental conversion was seeing Christ in the excluded person. That's how he starts off his testament. The Lord led me, and I allowed myself, of course, to be led. And I had mercy upon them. In the Latin word, to do mercy, the biblical expression, miserere, miserere. But the, it, it, it translates the Hebrew, rakam, which is a very hard concept. Rakam means God's crazy love for us. So that I begin to love someone crazily, that is to say, I don't care what the papers say or my friends say, I'm going to help this gay person or I'm going to learn to help this gay person or this, this imaginated person. God's crazy love. God loves me. Really. Even these people don't, don't seem to be so lovable. If you ever have a chance, there's a Jesuit called James Martin. James Martin has written a wonderful book called Jesus, just Jesus. He's one of the editors of America. And he has a blog and a Facebook. And he writes a meditation every day. And it's Father James Martin SJ. And the other day he had a meditation on God's crazy love. And God's crazy love that he loves, you know, he loves uh, uh, Hillary Clinton, he loves Obama, he loves uh, you know, God's crazy love. God loves us. And you and I are supposed to somehow reflect that love, and I think particularly as friars. What time is it? Some of you are getting tired. Quarter to 11. 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 Hmm? got a few more minutes. In doing mercy to this person, the Samaritan Gospel, the Pope commented on the other day, Francis ex experiences Godless love, and Francis gets God's love. The Lord led me among them. I had mercy on them. I did something for them. And when I left them, that which seemed bitter to me was changed into sweetness of soul and body. And after a little, I lingered and I left the world. The bitterness of sweet and body. Tied to the mercy experience is Francis's understanding of God's crazy love. Sweetness, not just of soul, but of body, that is of everything. God has a new face for Francis, and part of that face is the leper. And then I lingered and I left the world. Exide de seculo. Which doesn't simply, in the, in the Middle Ages, you could leave the world in two ways. You could leave it spiritually by entering the monastery. You could leave it canonically. When Francis goes before the bishop, uh, his father's clothes and all that. He's leaving the world canonically. Okay. Um, uh, 
And so when he does that, when he both leaves his father and he puts himself under the care of the bishop, he's also uh, putting himself under the care of the church. The bishop becomes his dad. The bishop becomes his father. And he says, when I did all this, I left the world. I left the world. Those are the first three lines. Only three lines. Do you see why we have to... St. Francis talked about when you read the scriptures, chew on them, taste them. You just can't sit you know, in your room, put your feet up, kind of make, you know, I spoke my pipe, and look, and look, that's a beer. The Lord granted me, brother, new pants. You know, the beer, when I was in sin, no, you know, the, the, it's not how you read this. What I'm asking you to do is not only read it, but apply it to you personally. The Lord granted you to do penance. What has that meant for your personal life? And I'm asking Paul and Ron and the others to continue to explain to you how this was born. When we pray for SCOTUS today, that we want to be a new creation. By the way, we've got to update the calendar in the, uh, the New Franciscan Saints. And uh, I will help you with that if you want. They like SCOTUS, you have to put SCOTUS in, their new friend, and, and, and the new the new missile in Greece is coming out soon. So if you want to update that, I will keep I'll keep you informed. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes? How, how, this sounds so real in reality, but how did the idea that hot lady poverty was whoever it is? It's easier. How, how it's did easier. that become the primary reason? It's easier. <sighs> It's easy for me to give you a 10 cents, but I hate the nigga. The world is filled with people who give you the shirt off their back, provided you promise to take it and go away immediately. <laughs> Think about it. They don't want to spend 10 minutes with you. I'll give you five bucks, take it, but go. Archbishop Sheen tells a story when he went to Africa. At the end of one mass, the nun said to him, well, I want you to give a crucifix to the people, leprosarium. So he gave the crucifix, they came up, and leprosy, you know, you're losing, but it was the fingers, huh? And he, he dropped the cross in, and the nun grabbed him, and said, you gotta do it that way, go back to the sacristy. You gotta put the cross in the hand, your hand as the touch, their hand. Otherwise, you offend them. Poverty, poverty is easy. Poverty in the monastery is easy. Yeah. I have everything I want. Just, uh, this is a big game. I have everything I want. I have a TV in my room. I have beer downstairs. I, I have a. So I don't know what this poverty is. We can re rethink that whole thing. All right, let's let's not let's be honest with ourselves, okay? What is this part? We say, I profess poverty. What, what, what are we saying? I, in fact, live better than my mother, God rest her soul. Was the I do not have the financial worries that my niece and nephew have. I have no, no problem at all. Now, this is why, you know, I think the world looks at us. That's why a lot of these groups, are, they look at us. That's why young people who enter are entering Mother Teresa's group. Now, because they look at us and say, what are you saying? You guys sat with me, some of you, four of you, at, at dinner yesterday in, in the Friars' dining room. You, you sat with me in the dining room, four of you. That's how we eat every day. Indeed. There's soup, there's soup, or there's pasta, there's salad, there's meat, there's bread, there's dessert, every day. So unless I'm bullshitting my brain, I ain't poor. I always talk about spiritual poverty, all nonsense. This is what Francis is saying. That make it, let's throw it up in the year. Let's be honest. Next year is the year of the consecrated life, huh? The whole year that the church is going to be consecrated for consecrated life. We'll put a microscope to this stuff. But Francis's first experience is not poverty. He says it. His first experience is to see Christ in the excluded. That's the text. 
Paul, do you agree? Ron, do you agree? Yeah. That's the text. <coughs> he does not talk about. Poverty comes later. His first experience is to go among people who are excluded, who are hated, who are marginalized, who are thrown out of the city, who are, who are uh, uh, acclaimed dead, who can't drink, who can't eat. And he says, I found Christ in them. That's what he says. And that's why I, ch I chided you last night about playing friar for three days. You have in your constitutions tithing, you have to pay not much. Huh? That's a way of you expressing some type of material poverty, too. We have a group who comes here every year. They are like you, but they're Benedictines, the brothers of St. Gregory. One of the big problems is the guys won't give any money. And yet they belong to an order, they won't give it. And the superior says, would you please give? Yeah, you know. ah, well, you know, I just bought a new Jeep, you know. <laughs> <laughs> These are the realities, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, um, I, I just know from my own experience working with the brothers yeah. who are and the brothers who are about to be, there are there are several who could not make this this gathering. Sure. But I mean, they're 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 lining up. But there are brothers sitting in this assembly who are indeed. Poor. Believe it. And I had a conventional say to me, I don't understand you, you know, you just have the best of both worlds. Yeah, no, you don't. And I said, Do you have a suit? Oh, yeah, I got it at, uh, at uh, Joseph Banks. And I said, <laughs> My suit has more, more holes in it already, and I can't afford a new suit. Okay? Um, I took my habit to a cleaner, and he said, $28, two pieces. I said, I can't pay 28 He said, well, do you expect me to allow my business to falter because you, you can't pay, 28, pay me $28? And I said, oh, I said, the last thing I would want in life is for your business to fail. I turned around and walked out, and I went to Price Chopper, and I bought now here we go, I can't remember. Well I well I And I washed my hammer all the time. And four dollars a bottle. Four dollars a bottle, yeah. so on and so forth. I throw mine in the you know, and um, and then there are some of us who um, I know I know personally, I mean I don't know what the heck to do with this building that I own. Sure. Because there are so many churches that have gone out of business or they have merged and so on and so forth, and got a letter the other day from a church where we built the organ over in Massachusetts. It was a uni um, United Church of Christ. Wonderful, wonderful people. I felt like I was a member. Yeah. We were all members of the congregation yeah. where they treated us. And they said they could not believe that they were writing a letter like this. But their attendance has gone eight people on a Sunday. That's right. They can't afford us to come to come twice a year. So, you know, we're we're living on business that's barely dribbling in, and there are some brothers here um, who, and I'm one of them, thought I'd be out of a job, and another one thought he was going to be out of a job. So, so we, this is, this is part of what we live. This is what I mean by, this is the contribution that you bring yeah. to us, yeah. you see. Mm -hmm. and, and and the first reaction of the fries, mm -hmm. some fries. I, every, I told you the first time we met, every group like yours is a critique to some type of Franciscan living. We want to do it differently. Mm -hmm. Benedict's group was. And as we approach the year of consecrated life, you don't have to make an apology for your life. I said, this is what the Lord did to me. Mm -hmm. Right. This all started with my spiritual director sharing my stories, yeah. sharing my travels with him. Because I was very young when my mother was going, Ah, your father's going to be dead in two weeks. Right, right. What am I going to do? Right. You know, and I got scared. Yeah. And so I, I left the novitiate. Yeah. The, 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 the novice master said to me, Alan, I'll, I can still see him lifting up the, the desk, desk blotter. 
I will <laughs> sign, a, uh, sign a document that I was le not leaving under duress. Right. So on so forth. The man was absolutely wonderful to me. He said, we can wait on this if you're not sure. And I can see him lifting it up and putting the paper under the. Yeah. And he said, well, you know, and I'll, I don't care if it's 2.30 in the morning, knock on my door, you know, so on and so forth. So when this whole concept was shared with my spiritual director and we were, got up and running, it was, we ne never thought of, never crossed my mind, nor did the founding group ever articulate anything that we were doing something better than somebody else. That was not, uh, that is not what constituted us. What constituted us was something very simple. To be open to the Holy Spirit. The Lord led me. And, and to be obedient. Yeah. And that is what I personally feel every day when I swing my butt on the mattress before my feet hit the floor. It's a wonderful day. God is calling me to this. But this is what the point you have to make, and this is what Cabo O'Malley says. You're not living in, 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 in critique. I mean, the critique has to be on our part, what we see in you. You're living what the Lord has called you to do. Boston. Boston. I have to then look at it and say, hmm, what are they telling me? That's my job, okay? Hmm. You, your job is simply to live. St. Francis would what did with the church in his day. He did not criticize it. He simply lived a life, greater reverence to the Eucharist. There was no Eucharist in his time. Greater reverence to priests, priesthood. Just lived it. Your job is to live this charism that the Lord has inspired you, and we have to look at it and say, hmm. now we can look at it in two ways. The hell are these guys? Mm. Or three, we can be jealous and angry. <laughs> I always use the line when, when some brothers are coming to me and they say, well, this one said this, and this one asked me that, the other one said the other thing. And I will say to them, you are dealing, I'm sure you're dealing, or you're possibly dealing with someone who doesn't understand their own thing. And if they can't understand their own thing, they're certainly not going to able to understand yours. I do think, though, that you, as you, now you approach your 25th year, and, and you wrote me about it, it's, you've got to get that oh, official um, canonical right. stamp. We're meeting with the bishop on the 10th of yeah. December. And the, he'll give it to you, and that's easy. Because that alleviates lots of problems. Oh, absolutely. Cardinal Malley in Boston took them all under his wing, and nobody could say a word. They have the approval of the Cardinal Archbishop of Boston, Boston. And that, you know, that saved a lot of, lot of other problems. Because some questions are legitimate, not just to you, to many. Well, are you approved? Mm. Others, uh, so that takes away. But the other thing is, you know, what St. Francis says, St. Francis did not, and we'll get onto it later, not criticize the church, but he lived very differently. When churches were dirty, he went and cleaned. Uh, we'll talk about it tomorrow, about the Eucharist. He wanted everything to be preziosa. Just went in and did it. And you are called, whatever the Lord has led you to do, <clears throat> to share that, your own petite histoire, to go forward, mm -hmm. trying to, to live this following of Christ in, 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 in the spirit of Francis. But I'm submitting to you this morning that Francis's first um, movement of grace was to the excluded. Then he decides how he's going to do that. But he first sees Christ in the school. That's what he says. That makes sense to anybody. Or not sense to anybody. Well, does St. Clear have an influence on him for this? I think that's a lot of baloney. Uh, there's a whole school of thought which this guy says is Francis and Claire, Francis and Claire. She was influenced by him. She takes his thing and she does her own, spins off her own. Claire uh, brings a feminine dimension to all of this, but that idea that they were, you know, one and the other and the other, <coughs> that's very poetic. It's very poetic. She actually runs her grammar. She does her own thing in them, as far as the rule and estimates and runs a long time. Uh, but she was inspired by him, of course, and just you know, Father, I recall uh, seeing a uh, biography of Francis where many times Claire was angry at Francis because she was, he was gone. 
and and she was he's saying, "Where did our spiritual father?" When you read Vaucher and others, he particularly distanced himself from yeah. them. He also says in the rule to Christ, keep away from them. He distanced himself. He had that sense of like they have to do their thing. And when he asked him at the end of his life, uh, "Should I go to Laverne and pray? Should I go and preach?" He said, well, "You're called to do both." Uh, she understood quite well, but, but see this idea of them being, you know, I don't know how, how, how to say it, but she's a, a she she takes she does what Paul did, takes this and, and adapts it to her life as a cloistered nun, and brings her own intuitions and her own graces and her own blessings to it. Uh, very very important. One more question, and then we'll we'll be yeah. there. Yeah, I've got a question, but I can tell a quick story. Sure. The like the um, the uh, there was a conventual friar brother who was uh, given to us by their provincial to walk with us, and lo and behold, he was in Rome and elected one of the assistant generals. Yeah. So the provincial assigned us another person who was who was a cleric. Yeah. And. Um, I've known known him for years, and he was uh, whether he was whether it was conscious on his part or not, but he was trying to just sort of treat us as his own group, sure. and so on and so forth. And you distance yourself. And we got into trouble. Sure. Okay, um, but then we came here, and um, Father Rock, and now yourself. Nothing but affirmation. Well, what is your thing? I mean, you know. You know, and so on and so forth. And the um, the, the, the the great the great feeling that there is, and and understanding when we when we see those pillars and start up the road, it's almost like your heart starts to beat. Oh, I'm home. Well, you see, the example you were giving in in, in Boston, there was the. What was their name? They, they, they died out now. Little Brothers, Little brothers and Saint Francis. I was associated with them because they came to Rome and they wanted to speak with Cajetanessa. Cajetanessa is a great Franciscan scholar. And I lived with Cajetanessa. And Cajetanessa helped them, uh, so on and so forth. But the whole thing centered so much on Brother James. James. Uh, either he's dead now, he's in the hospital. He's in a nursing home. Nursing home. Don't worry, don't worry. That is, he began to to get ill and so on. The whole thing collapsed. Yes, I knew them very well. Who well, got yeah. married? All that. But there were various priests, taking up your point, who wanted them to be there as guys of my province. Oh. If you read James's book, he says, "Father so and so, Father so and so, the canonical advisor," and rather than give them wings. They were, you know, so they had the nuns, and then the whole thing is just falling apart. Yeah. And it's very sad, because they were, James, a holy, good, male, oh, authentic, and I mean, you know, this was Campbell soup, you know, and, and nice hot, you know, I mean, he was, he was the real thing. But they got involved in all kinds of priests and legal things, and they were, you know, one fry wanted to make them an affiliate of our province, and Cardinal O'Malley came and said, no, they're affiliate me. But at that time, it was true. It was true. They had lost so many. And, and it's sad because it's one wonderful movement. One yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, I knew them when they were right. still living on Mission Hill. Right. right. I used to go there said mass for them many times when I came from Rome, try to help them and so on. And um, <coughs> He could not pass on to his men his charisma. I mean, if you read his book, <coughs> my name is in there, a few others, it got all tied up in all kind of stuff, and it just, it just disintegrated. It's very sad. I see your constitutions, and I'm not saying this, because I would say the opposite, quite different, quite well. See, his was so spiritual. So we're human beings living on this earth. You know what I mean? You, you were so spiritual, huh? You have to apply it to him. How do we eat? How do we live? What do we do? Yes, go ahead. I just want a Please. second, because I tried myself to yeah. start something yeah. here in New York, yeah. New York City, at 40 years ago. Yeah. And uh, just to reflect what you were saying, yeah. and what Brother Paul Allen was saying, is that 
Uh, my, one of my first spiritual directors was at the, at the postulate house yeah. for, uh, for Holy Name. Yeah. And the guard, he would have you to dinner afterwards, and yeah. the guard he would not talk to me. Yeah. See, the, what we have to do, what Rock and I do, I mean, I'm just a new guy on the block, but this is what I believe. You're the founder. You're the guy. This is your baby, not mine. I can help you. I can advise you. I'll help you with the calendar, but it's your job. You cannot impose on others your own way to Christ, and that, that's, that's, a, that's a, a defamation. You have to see how others, it, this is based on spiritual direction. Come to me for spiritual direction, I don't make you me. I force to where the Lord is leading you. If I make you me, this is a violation of who you are. And this is where Rock, because Rock has told me, Rock is, we're happy you're here, we encourage you, we love you, uh, we'll offer things to you, it's up to you. And that's why when you said to me, we want you to preach this retreat, and we'd like you to give the friars the same thing. Fine. Had you not said that, I would have said to you, what do you want me to talk to the friars about? Because you know the needs are. But you have to be very careful of clerical interference and that idea that the priest becomes the second founder. This has happened with nuns all the time. And it's destroyed community of nuns. It's destroyed them. The priests come in, I'm, I'm your spiritual father, before you know it, he's the supreme. We have it in the lives of saints, too. Then a priest came in, took over the congregation, and put the, through the superiority, we came in charge, yeah. all that kind of stuff. So you have to be very, and I think with Roth, you're very safe, and I think by me, that's your business. We will, we will support you, aid you, but then this is your family. Otherwise, you're not respecting the person. Yeah. But there's a, there's a whole different dimension. There's an aura. There's a kind of aura about it that is is just so positive as well, stars, if you remember stars when exploding I, When I first met you, and I did it with respect, I, I approached you with great respect. I know great respect. Did. Because the Lord has done something to you. I approached you with, you know, Rock said easily. Absolutely, I remember that. And I'm sure you sensed that. Oh, I did. You know, I didn't treat all the same with Rock. Otherwise, the priest becomes the superior of the community, and, 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 he, and he shows dissension. Yeah. Any one other question? Yes. Yeah. You discussed something about dealing with the excluded. Yeah. Helping the excluded. There's all kinds of exclusions, by well, the way. Well, yeah, well. Not just I'd sexual. Like, I'd just like to use two examples that I've, just two that I've had a chance to court. You're an RCIA teacher like I am, and one of the directors in my parish of it. And people come to you as inquirers. And they live every week to week hearing the teachings of the church. You nurture them, they have questions. Much of the time it's misunderstanding of what Christ is, what the church is. Uh, feeling the church is merciless, which it's not. Feeling that the church is judgmental, which, which it's not. Dealing with the prison ministry. You go to prisons to see people. I've been doing these ministries for a long time, and these are exclusion. These are people that are excluded. You work with them, and you think you just about have it. And sometimes, if there's a success, Christ can work through you successfully. And sometimes the guy in jail will say, I think you're a faggot. Why don't you get the hell out of here? I've had that happen. Okay? But, that's, but see, the jail, the person in the parish, the gay person, they're not the only ones that they want to exclude. The, the most profound exclusion is the person who believes that God doesn't have mercy on Yes. When in confession you absolve someone and they say, when you go to someone's deathbed and they're confessing sins of 30 years ago, did you, did you confess it? Yes. Were you absolved? Yes. Do you believe you're forgiven? This is why Pope Francis, read Cardinal Casper's book entitled Mercy. Read it. It's a tremendous book. The person, is, that's the fundamental exclusion. God does not forgive me. And that's a horrendous problem. Mm -hmm. I've, I've encountered with priests, old priests dying, lay people, we should be, be sensitive to all types of exclusion. Exclusion in the community, exclusion because of color, 
exclusion because of gender. And be careful of our own, the spectacles that we use. You know, the spectacles that we use. You know, uh, we have friars who are saying, I don't believe the gays should get any civil rights, they should get insurance. What, 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 what are you talking about? Two people living together, civil marriage, they should get all the insurance, all the, they could live happy. I was in the, in, in the university, a guy I knew, a professor, had lived with this other man for 30 years. He's dying, and the family would not let this other man in. This man was closer to him than his family was. Let's just sneak him up the back stairs of the hospital and knew him when his family left. Come on. Jermaine, I appreciate you. Did any of this make any sense to you? Yes. Oh. Want to spin out? I don't know how to express that. But I, I really enjoyed this and it's I mean, any points instilled that, quite a bit of information. Yeah. yeah, because you guys, you know, don't get clericalized, don't let priests take you over, go deep in Franciscanism, your constitutions are fine, juridically it's very important, but start to look at the writings of Francis and say, ooh, ooh. And, 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 and try to look at yourself, what the Lord has done to you individually while you're all here. What the Lord has done to Paul and the first ones, and what you are trying to say to the church. Because you are, remember, as part of the church, you have to say something. Yeah? It might just be that this is what the Lord is calling us to experience. So, on. so I think we'll take enough for now. We have confessions at 11.30. Where are those? Huh? Where are those? Church. In the church. Now, now, for the holy hour, because downstairs is so me uh, messy, and right after you have profession, we're just going to expose them as a sacrament, then each one does what they think best. Sorry. You want to stay there, you want to go outside, because it's going to be noisy. Well, we have benediction at the end. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. Because, right, well, right after that is your profession, though. Yes. Yeah.